You're listening to the Slavic Literature Pod, your shelf help guide to all things Slavic. Ready to go. All right. I'm ready. I forgot. For office hours, we just do, we just free ball it. Maybe we could say our names, you know? Yeah, I think that'd be good. Well, I was going to welcome, I was going to welcome our class in to say, right. hey, welcome. I, well, you're the, you're the TA's tier. I don't, do you welcome your, your, your students in when, when they, nobody comes to my office hours. Well, when someone does come, right? Like the day before something is due, they come in the office, you stand up, you shake their hand, you say, hello, welcome to class whatever your name is. No, oh. I sometimes will prop the door open to the okay. grad office where I loom. Yeah. Uh, because it, it doesn't have any mechanism to hold it open, <laughs> allegedly for security reasons. <laughs> now, no one's ever in that hallway. <laughs> right. I can identify who's in that hallway by the footsteps. <laughs> uh, there's a loud creaking noise that uh. happens sometimes on a consistent basis in the ceiling. And that will drive a man crazy. Uh, I've lost my mind several times this week just being there. Got it. Yeah. Now back to the students. The door doesn't. The door doesn't stay open. So we sure. and we have we have no doorstop. We can't afford one. So <laughs> I have to prop it open with a trash can. And clearly, budget cuts have impacted our trash situation, which is uh, notably dire, uh, because a lot of grad students won't take their smelly food waste uh, outside of the grad office. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, not a complaint, just an observation. <laughs> and <laughs> so the smelly food waste is propping open the door to the grad office where I'm looming. Mm. And uh, some some undergrads will come and, and knock, kind of perplexed as if we really do work here. Yeah, this is where they've stuck us. <laughs> And they'll come in and they'll probably they'll be like, oh, I'm looking for this person. And that person will emerge around one of our rows of desks. It's very cramped. It's very cramped. We have about eight people in our, co- in our grad cohort and it's still cramped. Um, they've jammed us into what is essentially a closet with <laughs> desks. Not enough desks for the number of people that are in the program, but anyways. Yeah. So the undergrad will come in. And then we'll sit down and talk. Does that answer the question? Yes. Well, it sounds like if they come in, instead of greeting them, you kind of maybe shoot them a death glare or perhaps threaten them with death if they don't leave because this office is already suffocating enough. What you hope when they come in is that the lights are on because otherwise you kind of look like a vampire. Because <laughs> what thing is, there's a motion sensor in, in there. And if you're not on the, the front side of the desk towards the door where nobody sits because you don't want to be pestered. Right. The lights will shut off on you. <laughs> so most people, when you walk in, are sitting in the dark. Hmm. Is this a cry for help? Uh, perpetually. Did the, the Northwestern grad students yearn for liberation? Well. They cry out for freedom? Well. <laughs> <laughs> we have to check out our, our, our unionization efforts. <laughs> <laughs> number, one, number one on the unionization efforts is getting a flip switch for our offices. And a doorstop. <laughs> right. <laughs> the pay is negotiable if we get a doorstop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll take a pay cut for a doorstop. <laughs> anyway. Uh, that's a the- horrible bit. You should cut all of that. <laughs> no, it's, it, most of that's going to get left in, I'm sorry to say. That's awesome. <laughs> anyway, well, you as, you, as you've been hearing us speak, the voices you've heard, this one, this, this entity right here is Cameron Lalana, a literature enthusiast and a guy working in media. Yes, the other entity is the one who looms behind the desks. <laughs> the one sitting enshrouded in darkness. Who will not give his uh, name because he doesn't want you to come find him. Right, yes. Uh, by, by email only. I'm Matt Garasimovich. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a podcast which is generally about Slavic literature, art, and culture. But today we are entering office hours, which means, yeah, of course, the test is coming up. So now you finally showed up to our office hours. Uh, and for for that fact, you're going to have to sit through us talking about some tangentially related topics before we get to covering uh, your paper, which it's already going to need a lot of work, let's be honest. It, let's be honest. It, it, if you're here today, it's a little too late. <laughs> um, gosh. All right. Before we get into anything else, let's talk about our, 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 our lives. And uh, well, our lives are deeply entrenched, as you may be 
as you may have noticed by our current output rate, a little bit, little bit entrenched in the gross cast, but we're juicing, we're juicing, and we're trying numbers to numbers main- are juiced. <laughs> The other day, Matt, and I, was, I was like talking to you about our numbers, which are pretty really high right now. And I made a joke about us like, oh, this is really good. But too bad we're like gaming the system to do it. And then I sat back and thought, I guess it's actually not gaming the system if you're getting higher views because you're putting out inc- an incredibly high amount of content every single day. <laughs> That's actually yeah. just upgrading your own workload. It's it's actually quite just the system. It's not gaming it. Right. <laughs> it is the system. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, before we get into that, Matt, I gotta, I'm gonna quickly knock on the door so we can descend into the hobby hole. Ooh, I'm not gonna. Yeah, stop that's way that. behind the desks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's what's in your hobby hole? What have you been getting up to this month? My hobby hole is starting to write my dissertation. Finally, <laughs> it's not a hobby; it's my real job. <laughs> it's what you get paid to do. <laughs> but now it's also your hobby. Right. It is also my hobby. I've got a very aggressive timeline with my advisor that I would like to meet. And this requires me to put in a lot of work at the same time as the Life and Fate series, which when we were planning the Life and Fate series was not a time I was intensively working on writing. And I thought, I am going to have so much time to do this series. It's going to be no problem. And now I regret everything. (laughs) It is pain for me. Yeah. On a daily basis. Existence. Yeah. Yes. It's good. <laughs> I actually really, I really like those times though when I'm like just really grinding it out. It's, it's probably not a good, it won't be a good series of mental health months, but I'll look back at that and be like, oh man, I got so much done. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the ult- ultimate, uh, I think, outcome of, of like what we do is the, the ratio is output to mental health and those are always an inverse data point yes we had it good for a little bit we had it kind of the three episodes a month was like nice and then we said what if we did an episode every day and three episodes a month (laughs) and also writing an email every day yeah well i to be fair i thought they would all be easier yeah and i also didn't realize that most other people that are leading read-alongs do not email every day (laughs) <laughs> that was a really severe um, <laughs> overestimation of our capacity. Wait, hold on, let me let me set the scene for you. We've been yep. we've been talking about this for a full month. Matt's been like uh-huh. showing me these things, and I'm looking. I'm like, oh yeah, that looks good. That sounds cool. I mean, here's some blogs. That's good. Uh, and then a weekend, we're like, this is actually kind of a lot of work. I don't know how they do this. And then like one day, Matt comes to me and is like, Cameron, I may have miscalculated. I just realized that these all these accounts I've been looking at actually do this on a weekly basis, not on a daily one. <laughs> Yeah. Now, if we were just discussing in Discord or Instagram or whatever on a daily basis, it would probably be fine. It's the writing every day that really adds up. And not only the writing, but now because I'm losing my mind doing it, which is reading and writing far enough in advance that you don't completely (laughs) screw yourself when you have something important going on. Yeah. And then going back to read the same day to to the old chapter to do the episode and talk on Discord. Oh my goodness, it's a lot of reading. It's been a lot of fun, don't get us wrong. We're having a great time doing it, but it is also it is also a bit of a karate chop to the brain. Yeah, well, thank you for saving me. Just because I'm complaining about something doesn't mean that I'm not absolutely enjoying it. Yeah. I would say it's been more successful than I thought. The number of people reading along, the engagement in Discord. Instagram was, was kind of a, a little bit of a whiff, but Discord has been great. I'm really glad to see our Discord popping off once more absolutely and if you are one of those people thank you thank you for being here thank you for the work that you are also putting in to uh go along with us and have a lot of thoughts about this work it's good i'm gonna send you something at the end of the series it's a spoiler there you go i I got something i want to send everybody yeah uh yeah yeah we got some we got some things we're looking forward to to um some of our plans may have gotten a little crazier most of them will not come to fruition Hopefully some of them will, but that may be a specific reaction to the amount of stress we put ourselves under (laughs) in the series. Yeah, I mean, we kind of talked about it and we decided we were going to start doing office hours once a month for at least the duration of the series here. And we'll come up with some other things to do and talk about during office hours. But this is just honestly a lot easier for us. It's not a research based episode. And the amount of research that we're doing, even for the daily life and fate stuff, it 
it does add up because there are things that are important to talk about here and there that require a little more in depth than just the, the quick one page chapters. Yes. So uh, we're going to, yeah, we're, we're going to take a little, a little easier with some of our main episodes, although we still do intend obviously to put out other stuff. We've got some other, also some interviews in the pipeline, uh, which we've already recorded, which are going to be coming out. You've already seen them in our schedule, which we're really excited to have you here as well to hear some other, you know, other perspectives, other stuff. I really enjoy doing our, our one with uh, Philip uh, Mitra's recently. That was a great one. And the episode we have coming up in February on the Czech manuscripts, also really good. That was a, I don't want to, I mean, it was pre recorded. They're all pre recorded as a podcast, but <laughs> it was recorded further in advance, which was honestly one of my better ideas. I didn't like stacking everything so much at the time that we were doing it because it was a lot of reading and prep work but it was looking at it now i think ah bless up i did future me a real solid (laughs) (laughs) yeah and i'm excited for that that uh that episode in the check manuscripts to come out too uh not only because it was also a good conversation but also just to maybe as matt is currently trying to um uh, fight the shadow essence of benedict anderson and his novel Mm -hmm. uh, his book uh, imagined communities talking about the imagined community created by the Czech manuscripts. Mm-hmm. Well, created partially helped by the Czech manuscripts, whatever. Interesting conversation to have. Yeah, that was good. And then I'm looking forward to finally starting to branch out to more uh, non Russian Slavic stuff because we catch flack in Discord every now and then for not doing enough of it. Uh, but Which is the, fair. I know. We've talked about it a lot, but the. the to do it in an already like research intensive series is really hard because the last thing we want to do is put out an episode in a country we haven't covered, have it be under informative and not helpful to anybody and then not return to that country for an extended period of time. That would be like such a disappointing and such a disservice to people that are looking for those resources, which Based on how few there are for Russian literature, I can only imagine some of these other countries. There's hardly anything in English. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of good books. We, I mean, we have a whole list of stuff from other countries we want to get to cover. It's just, you know, it's their novels of the same length that require a lot more prep work. So when we have a better time and if you want to shoot flack at us for not uh, covering fully Slavic lit at the moment in the Discord, totally fair. But keep in mind... You could instead be shooting flack at us for half-assing something in the middle of a bigger True. series on that country. So, so we're not going to do that, but just know we have plans. We have plans. Just know. Just know we that- overestimated our capacity for our current <laughs> series, but we're still doing it. We are still doing it. Just know we do all our plans out like one and a half to two years in advance, so it's really easy to announce things that we've planned had put in the pipeline for a long time. Unfortunately, the pipeline is usually about two years yeah i don't think people understand that yeah but anywho yeah. Pe- people that want to do I- interviews there's really no there's almost no chance that we can slot you in quickly but still reach out i mean <laughs> you got a free book to send yeah, us i mean it's it, it is possible sometimes but in general if it's not like an urgent thing it's like whew. yeah it takes some work yes yes it does well, that's a good hobby for you this month. <laughs> yeah, that's a good hobby. My job. <laughs> My jobby. <laughs> Do you have any hobbies this month? Sort of. I'm, now I'm, that you're no longer working full-ish time. Well, today's the first day of me not working full-time, so I haven't really... Well, you had your first break or your first vacation in yeah. like three years, I think. Yeah, at the beginning of the, Last. the first month, I had my first real vacation in a while. Um, yeah, which is good. I'm also I'm learning to dive right now. Well, I will I will start learning to dive on on Thursday. Men will play Dave the Diver once. <laughs> <laughs> I've 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 owned a dive watch for about eight years now, and eight years on from buying a dive watch, it is timely time to put into action and learn how to dive. What are you gonna do when you go underwater and you find out that you actually have a fake dive watch that is not functional? <laughs> well, I'm gonna realize that uh, I I got screwed by that guy I paid four hundred fifty dollars for for this watch, so, oh, which I bought no. secondhand. It's a it's a if it means anything to you for if, if you're a watch enthusiast, I don't remember the exact model number, but it's the Seiko Patty, the Pepsi can bezel one. Yeah, of course, the old Pepsi can bezel <laughs> one. Old, do you want me to? Well, I guess no one can. I won't show it to you because no one is gonna be able to see this. It's not a 
video podcast, but it, it does wow, look like a Pepsi a nice can. that's a nice lot. I, I like that Pepsi can. <laughs> Why are you showing me this? Nobody else can see it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and uh, today I was testing out my gear, my prescription goggles, my, my wetsuit. I need to make sure I can. I haven't swam in a while, so I need to make sure I can tread water or needed to make sure I could tread water for about 10 minutes. And so I looked like an absolute freak heading to my apartment complex pool <laughs> in a wetsuit and, <laughs> and goggles to swim. I'm sorry. What, you did it in your apartment <laughs> complex pool? Well, I don't have any other body. Well, the only, I have the only other body of water I have is the levee, which, yes. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I could do that in the levee. However, the levee is full of lead or other and other toxins you're not supposed to go in there i'm told so i was i thought that if you take the wetsuit to the levee that the levee was dry but i didn't realize it was just full of lead <laughs> that wasn't in the song <laughs> yeah you're not supposed to fish there but people do uh but yeah i took that to my apartment complex pool at i so misunderstood the story <laughs> no. i thought you went to like a, a place no i'm going like to go to a diving place. place for them to look at your suit no <laughs> and they also made you tread water i wasn't really tracking i'm going to be doing that officially at on thursday but today i just at 3 p.m i went to my apartment complex pool in a wetsuit and i in case I, you forgot how to swim <laughs> yeah well i just wanted to make sure it's been a while and I, I didn't realize it's been a while since I've been to the complex pool that it's not that deep. So it's only five feet of water. <laughs> so I had to tread feet. <laughs> I had to tread water in a pool that if I like treaded a little bit too hard, I would touch the bottom, <laughs> like fully just put my foot down. <laughs> <laughs> so there were no stakes whatsoever. <laughs> no. There were small children learning to swim next to you that were just dusting you. Thank God there were no, I like, usually it's just kids in that pool. And I was like, I was not ready mentally for, to be just me and a bunch of five-year-olds in this pool. Are there any windows from apartments or anything that overlook Oh yeah, no, that pool? The, the gym is directly next to the pool. There were many oh, people in man, the gym staring directly awesome. at me. You should do that like every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that could be cool, huh? That could be good. No, it wouldn't be cool, but it would be funny. <laughs> yeah, there is kind of an inverse relationship there, huh? In this case, yes, but I think there's something to the consistency of that. Yeah. This is the only training that you do. <laughs> Just tread water in a wetsuit in a pool where you can reach the bottom. <laughs> I I also had my uh, I had my snorkel attached to my mask, too. So oh, yes. Yeah. Breathing through the snorkel. <laughs> Did you see anything cool in the pool? Uh, no, just some dead bugs, really. That's disgusting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, anyway, that's my hobby right now is is learning how to dive. Uh, which I think I think I might get too into this. I feel like just spiritually, this feels right for me. I just feel like I I want to get in the water. I feel like I belong there. I'm terrified of it, you know. Um, I, right. I, I think I've told you this story before. Maybe some people in this podcast uh, don't know. It's been a while. I have a deathly fear of sea monsters, and that's not a joke. That's a real, actual fear I have. I, I get that. <laughs> well, here's the thing, is that I have a fear of sea monsters, which is such that I, I have to warn people if I go in the ocean with them, if I think I see a sea monster, I'm so sorry in advance, I will not be warning you. And I, I know that for sure. <laughs> because one time I was swimming, I, I was at this beach, and I was in Portugal, and the water was so clear, I didn't have my glasses on, so I couldn't see anything. I was swimming out to some rocks with, with a friend, and I looked down, and I see a giant brown mass, and obviously it's a, it's a big rock, but my mind immediately is like, that's a sea monster, and I black out, and the next thing I know, I'm on the oh, beach, no. and I'm just standing there staring out at the ocean. And like 10 minutes later, my friend comes back and is like, hey, dude, where'd you go? And I was like, I'm so sorry. I thought I saw a sea monster and I immediately turned around. And he was like, and you didn't say anything? And I was like, I, I like my brain physically was in such a state of terror that I, I just shut down. And I went back to the beach. <laughs> I, that's, that's not your most illogical thing I think I've heard. I kind of get it. <laughs> I'm glad that you get it. So if, I, if we ever go to the beach together, I guess I won't have to explain that to you. Oh, I, I do not like going in the water. Uh, not my thing. All right. Well, I'll go mm. in the water enough for the both of us. Please. For me, it's something about being, you know, when you dive deep enough, mm. I assume. Never done it. You're not going to convince me. <laughs> Just the vast expanse being surrounded by it. Yeah. And the quiet. It makes me want to have a panic attack right now talking about it. Right. Like envisioning it. Me too. But also in a way that draws me to it. Like, I feel like. Have you ever read philosophers talk about the sublime and they talk for like 20 pages about yeah. some bullshit and you're like, ah, this doesn't make any sense. To me, I think that's it. It's just going underwater and seeing something just 
mind haltingly terrifying. That's the sublime, <laughs> and that's what I want to experience. Yeah, I think I could do it if it was like um, I don't know, may- maybe a maybe like a reef, something kind of maybe that's shallow. I don't know if reefs are shallow, but I could. <laughs> I could do something with this. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's happy. Crabs are playing like instruments, probably. <laughs> That's what they do down there. Yeah, I think I so. I, my, my main scope of reference is The Little Mermaid. Sure. So. <laughs> right. That was the only movie I wanted to watch as a, as a young boy. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah, so I could do uh, none of it. I could, I could maybe tread water in a pool. Yeah. Well, if you want, I'll send maybe. you a wetsuit so you can do that. Well, please. I don't think you have, a, you don't have a, do you have an HOA pool? No. Okay. No. We do have a we have a small small pond in the front with a little fountain. All right. Uh, maybe I could go. I think it's only about uh, a few inches deep, but yeah. maybe I could try. You could try just setting like, it. Be the guy. I mean, it's currently about 23 degrees outside, so Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll make it even better. Yeah. Yeah. Well. 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 well that's what we've been getting up to um Let's okay. This has been on my mind this whole time. I'm sorry. We we were like, what are we going to talk about this episode? We've been doing so much. As you heard, we've been we've been thinking about Grossman so much that this was like, okay, uh, you know, we've been planning for Grossman so much. But let's do this. Sounds like you've been thinking about sea monsters more than Grossman. <laughs> well, I'm always thinking about <laughs> sea monsters, but that's a that's a different thing. I wish they were real, but I also don't. I just feel like I should have been a sailor uh, on some level, um, mm-hmm. like of the merchant marines, but uh, the kind of sailor that like gets eaten by the kraken. <laughs> well, anyway, Matt versus Reddit, one of our other big segments. Oh, we have a very specific one. It, this one, this one's, I feel like it's a little hard because we don't want to come off as like we're bullying these people, uh, and you certainly shouldn't go bully this person. But this was such a, this was such a post to read. Uh, and let me throw it over to you because you, you found this one. This was such a beautiful, beautiful moment. Cameron was scrolling through the Russian literature subreddit and said, "There's, there's nothing good here." And admittedly, it's been a bit of a dry run. Uh, between us and that subreddit right. in terms of... Well, when we say dry run, we mean about. it's just like they're just posting normal fine stuff. They're posting nothing which is absurd. They're just like, hey, look at this nice book. And you're like, yeah, that is a nice book. Cool. Thank you for sharing. To the credit of the subreddits, the things that we pick out, usually the people on there recognize as being, this is so dumb, why are you posting this? And that's great. This one, I think it's, I think it's pinned... On the Dostoevsky subreddit, or I just saw it first. As of one twenty nine, it is in fact one twenty nine. The date it is in fact pinned. The post is: Which order should I read Dostoevsky in, and which translation should I get? And these these are questions in quotes because these are questions that are asked. Dare I say daily on this subreddit? As if everybody on the subreddit has an aversion to clicking into it and scrolling past uh, zero posts to see that their question was literally just asked uh, on it. I get that they're valid questions to ask, but at the same time, I mean, probably at least one half of the posts on the subreddit are these two questions or some variant of it, and it is so annoying. So I thought, great, somebody finally made a pin post saying you're not allowed to do this anymore. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I only skimmed the post because, quite frankly, it was a sort of I ain't reading all that situation, and it was somebody talking about how they... Uh, asked they did two things one of them was they asked chat gpt these two questions and the second one was they compiled the first 50 plus threads they saw on google uh, about the books which oh my goodness you if you already had 50 plus threads again why are you asking the question you get one translation every like 10 years of one of his new novels you know what i mean it's not a it's like a it's a pretty rare thing i mean they come out but not that quickly Mm -hmm. i think Dostoevsky would have written uh, another novel mocking anybody who uses ChatGPT for tasks like this. That's kind of my point. Yeah. There's really not a lot of in-depth thought on this, as I just thought it was hilarious. Uh, I think that uh, the man who wrote the story about the other man who pokes his hurting tooth so that it continues to hurt, just so that he can, just so that he knows he feels something going against the grain so he knows he's still an individual that this man's work is being summarized by a large language large language model that um, doesn't think it's just sort of regurgitating a bunch of things that it also found on reddit awesome absolutely awesome s tier 
quality for me. This was like, it almost was like, is it satire? But it can't be. It was too earnest. That's the thing that gets me because this reading the post of like, you know, this person clearly understands what ChatGPT chat GPT is, does, and its limitations. There's a whole section on why you shouldn't blindly trust it. And this person is like, okay, here's what it is. And here's specifically what I'm doing here. I am not, this is not an ultimate one. This is a uh, us compiling the data of of what you have on these subreddits. So where this, this is not an ultimate answer, but this is just a way to collate all this data of what everyone else has been saying, you know, but, and this is quoting the post, but if you're not prepared to do that, you know, doing all the research yourself to figure out what is the best way to read, uh, you might as well, as well start with what most people are recommending, which is what ChatGPT has tried to provide. That's fair. However, you can just do that with, with an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> and just saying out of these many, uh, you know, that'd be a little harder. But the thing is that what comes here is just, it's the same thing, you know, at least if you're going to put it all into an Excel spreadsheet and said, okay, most people recommend notes from underground. You're like, okay, that's, you, that's an audience answer. This is the exact same thing. Just the illusion that there's any, any more, um, that there's anything else behind it beyond it just being, oh, this is what everyone else is saying, which the author says, yeah, that's what I'm doing here. And I that's why I'm like, if you didn't know what you're doing, at least that would be completely earnest. But if you already know the limitations of like, then why then why use something that's fundamentally not adding anything? I just think that the, the whole concept of breaking a Dostoevsky related question down into ChatGPT is so ironic, like within his own framework, that it is laughable. Yeah, that's what I think. Now, if that's the approach that you want to take, because it is a pretty simple question overall, ChatGPT could handle it, um, because honestly, it doesn't matter what you read first. Just read something. Stop asking. Just go read. And the amount of time that it took you to look up this, you could have already read like 10 pages. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Or you could take Matt's advice, which I think this is a more general piece of advice you generally give. Don't not- read it all. <laughs> that too. <laughs> but you know, beyond just not reading Dostoevsky or not reading anything no, ever. Don't read anything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah well, yeah. that's Matt's yeah. two main pieces of advice. But Forget you, how to read. <laughs> you go to his third piece of advice, which is for authors like this, start with their short stories to see the, the most bare bones versions of the ideas they like to play with before you go to larger novels and start making those connections and you start to say, oh, I think I saw something like this in that short story. Or like, if you go to like Notes from Underground, you're like, oh, it's really interesting how this woman at the end of the novel, the I think she's a prostitute, a sex worker, is like, it's really interesting the role she plays as kind of a questioner of this main character. That's kind of funny. That's something similar to, kind of similar to, you know, a meek one or kind of similar to Sonia in Crime and Punishment or, you know, similar to this and that. Yeah, good, great. You know, that's, I think that's exactly what, the benefit of reading those shorter shorter stories i know one of those was crime and punishment not shorter but you know making those connections i think that was that was one of the very first pieces of advice you ever gave me before we started this podcast and it's been probably the one i've held on to the most just in general that's nice i don't remember really saying it but it does make sense so i you know i'll take credit <laughs> i just think because so much of it is personal preference that instead of leaning on your own personal preference which you have mm. and know that to ask a like, I'm not even a person who has expertise on it just to just well I guess people do because they do go to Reddit and try to do that and then they're met by people who borderline questionable expertise mm-hmm. some people are very knowledgeable there and then I would say most are borderline unhelpful yeah it's a it's a real mix as to who you're gonna get responding but well, I guess that's how it goes yeah yeah, I think it's funny. Yeah, like in this context, in these very comments, you're seeing some people being like, "I will never do this ever," and also other ones are like, yeah, "It's also a good point of like, you know, the limitations of such as." And everyone, the Chat GPT mostly recommended. They're like, "What translation should I read?" Mostly recommend three out of five. It gave her Pavel and Volhansky, and everyone involved is like, "Yeah." So that's obviously just them winning the PR battle, right? Of like, yeah. So why ask this question at all? Like this person's already like, like the translations by. Michael Katz, trans- Michael Katz and Oliver Reddy's translations seem to be pretty well regarded. Like, yeah, they are. They are. Michael Katz, as, as people who work with, do do great translations. You already know that. Why do you need to ask Trat GPT that? Who's going to tell you Pavier and Balhansky is the one you should read, which you already know is, if it works for you, it works for you. If it gets your reading, it gets your reading. But not typically, in my experience, not my favorite translations. And I think that's true for others as well. No, this subreddit for me is just 
very strange. Very strange. It's not like people who don't. I mean, there's some people who don't know better, but the thing is that it's like these people in the middle who like clearly know enough that it feels like you should know, should understand why this is not a useful exercise. Yeah. Uh, like the chat, like the explanations for okay. What should you read? One, Notes from Underground. Two, Crime and Punishment. Three, The Idiot. Four, Demons. Five, Brothers Karamazov. Um, not, I don't even necessarily disagree with that reading order, but then you like read the explanations. And again, these are just explanations that's pulling, and I think everyone involved would, would tell you it's just pulling that from what other people have written. Um, and you know, take this as nothing more than what people are recommending. Notes from Underground. This novella is a good starting point as it introduces you to Dostoevsky's philosophical and psychological themes. Great. What well, that's the- what we said. <laughs> Uh, Crime and Punishment. Ah. Move on to this classic, which is one of Dostoevsky's most well-known works. It delves deep into the human psyche and morality, which is like, this is something that gets me about talking about Dostoevsky specifically, is you talk to someone and they're like, yeah, it gets really into philosophical moral, moral themes. What themes? Any other time you talk about someone, you'd be like, you can say, uh, you generally, you'd, you'd expect them to say, this is what it explores. But for some reason, there's certain authors, you can just say, it explores philosophical themes, and you can stop there. And everyone's like, yeah, that sounds pretty deep. I should get into that. No explanation of what that means, even slightly. And I think... Yeah, you'll figure it out when you get there. <laughs> but the, the, the reason why that bothers me, me with Dostoevsky so much is that he's so easily misunderstood. Because there are so many people... Like, I, this is um, a friend of mine, her ex-boyfriend, I, when she was introducing to him, me to him, uh, he, I walked into his apartment, and he had on his coffee table Ayn Rand, The Fountainhead, and uh, Crime and Punishment. Or one of the Dostoevsky. Maybe it was Brothers Karamazov. It doesn't matter. And like those are his two favorite authors, Ayn Rand and, and Dostoevsky. And if you know anything about either of them, you can understand why that's a kind of a strange set of choices. And he would always kind of talk about Dostoevsky in these very vague terms. Like it's really interesting to get into the morality and psychology of his work. Um, and then you see the, the way this guy lived his life of like convincing his girlfriend to move to another state with him, uh, having a breakdown and breaking up with her like three months later and making her break the lease and still asking her to pay rent or utilities in the apartment that only he was living in. And like... You know, obviously, what you read and the things that you are interested in is not always going to line up one to one with your own morality. But just like the way I could, so that's some personal disdain I will admit I have for this man. Uh, but in addition to just talking to him, somehow it, what, for whatever reason with Dostoevsky, you can just get away with saying absolutely nothing for twenty minutes, and people are like, "Yeah, that sounds pretty smart." Dostoevsky has very specific points to make, and frankly, and I hate standing up for Dostoevsky. But, like, he would not like most of you. All you, Anyone who's like, yeah, I just really like how these characters are so dense and dark and they're kind of, like, tough and complex like me. I don't know if you got to the end of Crime and Punishment, but that's not, like... <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know if you got to the part of Notes from Underground where our main character gets, like, absolutely destroyed by this woman who shows up in the last, like, 20 pages or so mentally and is like, oh, oh that is a good point, actually. <laughs> yeah. And he doesn't ask her to pay utilities either. <laughs> right. So I, I just, I, I think I'm more of a Dostoevsky defender than Matt, just because I think Dostoevsky is a really interesting, complex writer. And, and it's, he's been so adopted by people who are just want to give off the appearance of being smart and say nothing, but will just say something like, it's just the psychology is so interesting. What psychology? Tell me. What, what, what about it? Be specific. Please elaborate. Yeah, right. I've just run into these people too often, I think. Yeah, I think the advice I'll give people when they start saying like, "Who should I read when I'm when I want to read Russian literature?" I'm probably just say Vasily Grossman. Everyone talks about Dostoevsky and Tolstoy like they're the end all be all, but there are so many other writers that are also great. Right. And you should probably read those two eventually. But hey, hey, come on, hey, that's our official uh, proclamation on Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Hey, come on, hey, <laughs> come on. Uh, yeah well i think i don't know is that, unless there's anything else you want to go over i feel like that's all we really had for today i, th- I think i'm good I haven't read any bizarre literature so yeah neither have i I've, I've just been reading grossman and things related to grossman so it's not really that bizarre it's kind of <laughs> just sad yeah yeah so i mean we're a little bit of a shorter one today we're, we're apologizing for that but we've been just getting our butts kicked I'm by not this apologizing. series my office hours are over i, can, I fulfilled my contractual <laughs> obligation <laughs> Oh, I guess I should ask you, hey, Matt, what do we cover next week? I, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but if you skipped all the way to the end, here's your hint. Next week, we are going to be, I would say, discussing, we did read it, but I would say it's more of a discussion of the book, The Czech Manuscripts with Professor David L. Cooper. It is a really fascinating conversation. You don't need to know anything about 
Czech history to enjoy it. I would say you don't need to have read the book either to attend this discussion. Uh, you may want to read the book after you hear the episode because it is quite a fascinating story. And I don't know about you, but I definitely learned a lot from it. Me too. Me too. And I'm really excited for it to come out. The music used in this episode was Starai Kino by Paramotka. You can find more of their stuff on Bandcamp or Spotify. The links and spelling are in the show notes. And we'd also like to extend a thank you to all of the people who make this podcast possible. Lauren, Erica, Michelle, Juliana, Diane, Oleg, John, Timex, Melissa, Baron, Aldo, Ben, Gabe, George, Claire, Amy, Allie, Soraya, Jackson, Molly, Emma, Mike, Marianne, Mickey, Eric, Mike, Peter, Eric, Ben, Claire, Jeff, Inez, Mai, Robert, Joseph, Daniel, Lou, Nina, Gary, Janice, Mary, Anne, Isaac, Emily, Amanda, Caitlin, Yitza, Irini, oh, and Pakrab. Oh, that was... Struggled to get to the end there. Just barely made it in one breath. All right. Well, in that case, you'll hear from us again soon. Bye.